Welcome. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We launched this series a couple of weeks ago to engage our extended USC Dornsife community in a series of dialogues with our experts about various issues that so many of us are thinking about these days. Academics and public health officials have warned us for years about the likelihood of a major pandemic, but it turns out we were still caught pretty off guard when this one struck. Today, we're going to explore some of the reasons why we as a nation weren't better prepared um, when the coronavirus hit us and hopefully gain some insights about how we might do better next time. So let's get on with it. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Mark Perry, who's going to lead our discussion. Um, Mark Perry is an acclaimed writer, historian, and foreign affairs analyst. He's authored 10 books, many of which go deep into the lives and the minds of American leaders. He's an award-winning journalist, and his articles have been featured in publications including the LA Times, the Washington Post, Politico, the American Conservative, and many others. Perry is the former co-director of the Conflicts Forum, and he's also served as a senior foreign policy analyst for the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation. You might recognize him not only by his byline, but also from the screen. He's often seen providing commentary and expertise for news outlets like Al Jazeera Television and CNN and now he can add Dornsife Dialogues to that impressive resume. Please welcome Mark Perry. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful intro and I appreciate it. Please allow me to introduce our two panelists today for our discussion. First is Andy Lakoff, who's a professor of sociology and the Divisional Dean of Social Sciences at USC Dornsife, and the author of Unprepared Global Health in a Time of Emergency, in which he describes the challenges of properly anticipating and preparing for biological threats. Also joining us is Nils Gilman, who previously worked as Associate Chancellor at the University of California, Berkeley, and as Research Director and Scenario Planning Consultant at the Monitor Group and Global Business Network. Welcome to you both. It's great to be here. I'm coming to you from Arlington, Virginia, where it's a beautiful day. I hope it's beautiful where you are. Let's start. My first question, I think, to, um, to introduce this subject is for Andy Lakoff. In 2001, as I reported in Foreign Policy article recently, there was a simulation of a pandemic outbreak in the United States. And what that simulation showed is that there would be a surge in hospitals, there would be deep political disaffection, uh, lockdowns wouldn't be obeyed, there would be would be real medical problems that we'd be facing. There'd be a spread of misinformation and disinformation. This was in 2001, nearly 20 years ago. So we should have been prepared and maybe we were. My question for you is, why were we taken by surprise? So it's a great question. Uh, as you say, US officials, health experts and others have been warning us for over two decades that we were due for some kind of disease emergency, whether it was a bioterrorist attack, which is what was simulated in dark winter, um, an outbreak of bird flu, there was a lot of concern about that in the early 2000s, or something else that we might not expect. Uh, and for 20 years, um, we've been engaged in exercises like dark winter, making plans, um, developing scenarios, stockpiling countermeasures. Um, in fact, the US, uh, up until last year was seen around the world as the most prepared country in the world. There, uh, a think tank put together a list of which countries uh, were most prepared for some kind of major biological catastrophe, and the U.S. ranked first in the world on that. So you end up with a puzzle. Uh, why has our response been so seemingly disorganized? Why were we caught off guard? I think there's a, a few hypotheses we might advance. Um, one is that when we were talking about preparedness, uh, over the last two decades, we actually weren't necessarily looking at everything we should have been looking at. Um, we were looking at early detection systems, at certain kinds of medical response capabilities, um, but we might not have been thinking about a broader picture of competent governmental leadership, um, response capacity that was flexible, attentive to alerts. Um, we may have been preparing for the wrong things. We may have spent too much time thinking about a bioterrorist attack and not enough time thinking about uh, a new type of emerging disease for which there were no medical counter countermeasures like drugs or vaccines available. Um, and arguably, 
preparedness maybe isn't even the right question. We need to be thinking much more broadly about our public health systems, readiness uh, for everyday problems, as well as novel and emerging threats. So I think we're gonna be assessing this for the next months and even years. Nils, let me turn to you. I, um, in preparation for our uh, dialogue today, I went onto your Twitter feed and one of the things you said really struck me because I happen to agree with it. When you said, what we're seeing today is the party of science versus the party of magical thinking, which I thought was exactly right. As I said in, uh, in an article I wrote for the American Conservative on the pandemic, the division in America seems now during the pandemic to not be red versus blue or Democrat or Republican or conservative or liberal, but people who believe in science and people who don't. Do you think that's an exaggeration or do you think it's accurate? Um, I, do think, I do think there are people who uh, believe in science is a particularly loaded term, right? Let's say put faith in scientists and people who are skeptical of scientists is probably the more accurate way of putting it. I should say that when I made that tweet, I was actually specifically reflecting on a conversation I had with a friend in Britain who talked about how uh, the division between the remainers and the leavers um, has reconfigured around, uh, around the response to the coronavirus, where in Britain, uh, you know, one faction has become very intent on reopening as quickly as possible, um, closing borders, but reopening the economy. And the other faction has said, no, we need to defer to the, the scientists who say that we need to, the epidemiologists who say that we need to close up shop uh, for longer in order to protect the public uh, and the public health. Um, and unsurprisingly, perhaps, it was the Brexiteer uh, faction within the British polity that was more in favor of closing borders and opening the economy. And it was the Remain faction that um, you know, was more inclined to uh, defer to the experts. So I think the real question is a division between people who defer to expertise and people who don't defer to expertise and prefer to rely on other kinds of, shall we say, epistemologies or rationalities for thinking about how we address public policy concerns. It's interesting because uh, in the midst of this pandemic, it, we've, we've kind of uh, torn the scab off of all kinds of political questions. Uh, globalizations versus building borders. Uh, you just mentioned the reliance on expertise versus the non-reliance on expertise. I think that people really want immediate answers and those are hard to come by. The analogy I come up with is, uh, if I'm sitting here in Virginia and there's an earthquake, I can go next door and ask the guy next door, what the hell happened? He can say, well, I, I was originally from California. I've been through an earthquake. Don't worry, it's an earthquake. And I can go across the street to a guy who's got a shortwave radio and he can give me the latest news. But during a pandemic, where do I go? Who's the experts? Should we believe them? I was reading this morning that we've got uh, perhaps a, a treatment. Other scientists say, no, we don't have a treatment. How do we sort through, Niels, I'm asking you, how do we sort through good information from bad information in the middle of what's a, a global crisis? So let me cut at that in a couple of different ways. One is that um, you know, I think you're making an astute point that how do people know what they think they know, right? There, there's basically, three ways that people come to understand the world. One is through direct experience, right? You can go outside on the street and see things. Um, another one is by relying on some kind of an expert, whether that's uh, you know, a government statistical agency or a scientist or a doctor or you know, an, uh, an, earth, an earthquake uh, specialist or what have you. Um, and the third way is to rely on um, you know, uh, opinion leaders, as they say, you know, the media. Um, and I think that there's been an increasingly, is, there's been a growth and distrust in expertise, and this has been documented by many, by many people over the, uh, over the last few years, where the kinds of uh, organizations, entities, and individuals who used to have the status to warrant to speak with authority on things are increasingly doubted by larger and larger segments of the public. Um, and they instead prefer to rely on their own personal experience, make their own judgments about things, or rely on other kinds of you know, opinion for uh, leaders, whether it's Fox News or the president 
um, or uh, you know, Alex Jones or what have you. So people choose different kinds of places to go for information in these circumstances. And the reality is that I suppose all of us are inclined to go to information sources that confirm our own biases in one way or another. Um, and the fact that we've broken up the, uh, a common informational sphere into all these different informational silos makes it very easy for all of us to forum shop for you know, the information source that's going to allow us to continue to believe the things we already believe. And so I think it just has continued the fragmentation of our you know, collective understanding of reality. Andy, playing off what Nils just said in the fragmentation, here oh. we are in the middle of a pandemic. Hopefully we're kind of on the down slope of it. Uh, maybe despite the simulations and our, that should have prepared us but didn't, is it possible now to kind of plan, to begin the planning for the next one to be more prepared? Or are we always gonna be faced with some kind of black swan event that we think we're gonna be able to get under control and we're gonna, it's gonna instead teach us of our own fallibilities? Let me step, step back and make one comment that I think is related to this about the role of expertise in an emergency. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that the scientists themselves are operating under conditions of extreme uncertainty. It's, you know, the analogy would be the fog of war. Um, the virologists, and epidemiologists still don't know definitively the rate of infection, the um, case fatality ratio for this disease, whether in fact immunity is conferred through exposure um, there's a lot of different epidemiological models um, being put out there, um, and some of them are in conflict. So I think that when you talk about the public's reception of expertise, it's important to understand the public is getting a lot of different versions of what the truth is, even from the experts. So all that is to say is that in, a, in the middle of a, an emergency like this, a, a pandemic, um, we, we can't rely on the, the long-term process of scientific peer review um, experimental confirmation and so on to tell us what to do. Um, so we're faced with uh, using pre-existing plans um, or using our existing conceptual frameworks to address an emergency. Um, I think the lessons that we're going to learn from this one have to do with uh, how the importance of good governance um, at the um, as opposed to having made plans five years ago, ten years ago. Um, at the very moment of the outset of an emergency, you need to put those plans into motion, and you need. Um, public trust in the leaders who are putting those plans into action. Let me, uh, can, I, I, can I just add that for one second? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who was perhaps uh, the greatest planner that we ever had as president, obviously organized the invasion of Europe during World War II and then, you know, ran a, ran a big university and then eventually became president of the United States. He had a, he has a famous line. He said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And what he meant by that was, that what the process of planning allows you to do is to exercise, as it were, the organizational and institutional muscles so that when the crisis happens, which is never going to be exactly what you were able to anticipate, you already have in place a set of procedures and mechanisms for you know, reacting in real time. Um, I think if you look across the world today, there's been highly divergent effectivenesses in terms of the response of policymakers and the communities that they serve in terms of abating the progress of the virus. And one of the factors I think that's quite decisive in that is, um, you know, we talked about expertise already, but I think just as important is actually the institutionalization of practicing and thinking through what the kinds of challenges that you may face, doing exercises where all the people who will be involved in having to deal with the responses are, you know, expected to participate so that when the crisis unfolds, you already have practiced before for the same reason that you don't just put on a play without ever doing a rehearsal. Doing rehearsals, they're not the same thing as a live performance, but they ensure that when you have to do the live performance, you're going to be better prepared to put on a good show. It's interesting. And in thinking about this over the last 24 hours, my experience comes from covering the U.S. government, covering the military in particular. And I can remember a, um, a conversation I had many years ago now with Casper Weinberger, Casper Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense. And I had been covering the Pentagon for a while and I was talking to him and I said, and he said to me, well, Mark, what surprises you most about the Pentagon? What is it that you don't like about the Pentagon? And I said, I said, nothing ever gets done. And he looked at me and he said, well, you're a good progressive. What do you want us to do? 
And I said, well, actually nothing. And he said, well, that's exactly what we're going to do. And this, this kind of anecdote keeps coming back to me because we expect our government to be very deliberate, very careful in its response, to take its time to assess threats, to only call on the people when absolutely necessary. And yet here we are in the middle of the pandemic and we absolutely require our government to be on top of it all the time, to react quickly and to be decisive when we've, we've actually created a form of government that, that cuts against that. So my question, I think, for both of you is very political. You know, if we want a government to act decisively, we also want a government that's going to be intrusive into our life, that's going to manage a pandemic crisis by doing what um, South Korea does. They're on their cell phones. How much is too much? What should we expect? I mean, I'm not certain that there isn't a distinctive um, form of emergency preparedness that could be much more effective that is uh, complementary to, to American norms uh, and suspicion of too much government intrusion. And in fact, you know, Nils referred to, to Eisenhower and during the Eisenhower administration, a, a template was put in place that involved um, the federal government playing a fairly um, circumscribed coordinative role during what was then the ultimate emergency, which would have been a nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. Um, and it involved integrating um, actors across the federal government, states, and localities. Uh, and it was not, it, it was not a totalitarian model of, of an intrusive state. Um, and we've seen examples of that in the past in, in successful emergency responses in the US. The problem really is that the folks now in the federal government did not practice that, did not work on that, did not think through, you know, who are the governors they're gonna have to talk to? How are they gonna have to um, work on distributing supplies to the places that are needed? And that's the muscle memory that, that Nils is talking about, why you do exercises. So the, the, the system of emergency preparedness that we have in place actually is specifically addressed um, to, to, to keep us from falling into uh, the kind of totalitarian society that, that Mark, I think you're alluding to. I mean, I agree with that, uh, Andy, but let me try to push you on it just a little bit, which is that I do think that um, government capacity um, isn't just about practicing. It's also partly about, you know, having the habit of, as Mark said, making various kinds of intrusions into civil society. When you have that kind of intrusiveness, uh, that's part of what the practice is. How do you interact with the public in an effective way? I do think the fact that you know Americans, um, you know, in general, um, and particularly you know people on the right in this country, uh, in recent years, have been very skeptical of the government having these kinds of powers, um, and uh, and and they've intentionally tried to shrink the size of government until it's small enough to drown in a bathtub, to use the phrase of one well-known right-wing ideologue on this topic. And if you do that. You know, that has certain advantages. It affords you in normal times, you know, more uh, freedom. Uh, but then, you know, when the crisis comes, you're not going to be ready if you've done that to the government. So I, I do think that that's a choice that, you know, we've made as a society to move down a path towards more libertarian, smaller, less high capacity government for all sorts of reasons. And, you know, that means that when a big crisis that requires a government that has had practice coordinating complicated responses, when, you, when, when that moment comes, you're just not going to have that kind of a government. Um, I don't think it's a surprise when you look at the countries that have been most successful in tamping down the outbreaks of the pandemic, the divisions are not between democracies and authoritarian regimes, right? I mean, obviously China had a very bad outbreak. I don't think they've been forthright about how bad it was. I think it was worse than they probably let on. Uh, but then they did, through draconian measures, manage to you know, largely suppress any further propagation if we believe the statistics, but certainly given what we're seeing about the opening up of the economy, reopening of the economy in China, it does appear that they have, you know, at least gotten it more under control. But it's not just in China, right? It's also South Korea, as Mark was mentioning, I think the poster child is actually Taiwan. Uh, you know, Taiwan's first case um, uh, took place uh, on the same day the U.S. had its first case, which was January 20th. Since then, they've had 400, as of yesterday, 429 total cases um, and six deaths, compared to the US having now over a million cases and uh, some 60,000 deaths so far. Taiwan's a democracy. South Korea is a democracy. They have 
a different set of values. And one of the things they have is, you know, it's, these are societies where, you know, because they're in difficult neighborhoods for all sorts of reasons, you know, have always had a much more mobilized population with respect to the government. So, for example, there's universal conscription into the military in both Taiwan and South Korea. The idea that the government can literally just take a, a year of your life and put you in the military is an understood thing that everybody accepts as part of the culture. Um, you know, we, we don't have that in this country. We haven't had, you know, there's a draft, but we haven't actually exercised that function. There's no universal um, conscription for the last half century. We don't have a culture in this country that really supports that kind of intrusive government. And, you know, people will feel differently about how, how good of an idea it is to be that way. I mean, I think you can distinguish between competent government and intrusive government. You know, let's take the, the German model as the kind of European poster child for what seems to be a much more successful, coherent uh, response to this. And I, you know, I don't think it's the same model as the South Korean model, I, but yeah, I do think you have a lot of public trust in government. I think you have a lot of health capacity. Um, you have a lot of surge capacity, um, available ICU beds, a strong health system. Um, all those things made it possible for Germany to have a resilient response to this, I think, without, the, without a lot of the kind of intrusiveness that we're worried about when we look at some of the countries like South Korea. I agree with that. I think that maybe the most important variable is actually trust in government. Um, you know, if you look at the countries that have had the most difficult responses, Italy, United States, um, Spain, the these are countries that are ruled by very different kinds of governments right now, but what they all have in common is a pretty deep distrust in, 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 in government. Whereas the countries that have responded really well, Germany, South Korea, Taiwan, China, the, the people, for better or worse, do have trust in their government officials and are willing to abide by what the government officials do. The one thing I might push back on a little bit, Andy, is that I think the relationship between intrusive government and competent government is perhaps a little bit, le they're not totally uncorrelated things, right? Part of the issue is whether people trust the government to make the right kinds of intrusions and whether governments have performed reasonably well when they have made intrusions. And I think there's good historical reasons why, you know, in the case of the United States or in the case of Italy, just to take two examples, people have a lot of skepticism about whether, you know, when the government actually does make interventions, whether they're successful. I guess I would just say when we, try to diagnose what went wrong. And obviously we're gonna to have to do this for over the next uh, months and years. Um, we may look less at whether the, the public in the United States trusted government and more at whether our own federal government trusted its own um, experts and leaders in, in, in guiding the response. So we, I mean, what, what the strange phenomenon that we had in the United States was a federal government that didn't itself believe or trust the plans that prior administrations had put in place to prepare for this. Before we go to uh, questions, and we have a whole slew of them, not surprisingly, let me just add a little spice to this. Um, I noticed on Twitter, not all my information comes from Twitter, by the way, um, but I noticed on Twitter the other day, somebody saying, well, this is a, if this is a war, we could, fight it, we could fight it like we fight the insurgencies in the Middle East. And I thought immediately, well, if we fight it like we fight the insurgencies in the Middle East, we're going to lose. So, you know, there's, there's a reason for lack of trust in government. The one thing that the United States should be good at, we spend a lot of money on it, we spend a lot of time training our experts. The one thing that we should be good at is war. But we haven't been very good. So we're not good at that. And the military is among the most trusted institutions in the United States, there's no wonder there's mistrust in government. And it'll be interesting to see whether at the end of all this, which I'll get to in a second, at the end of all this, there is a growing trust in the government if we handle this correctly. So let me, before we go to Q&A, let me ask a, a broad question of both of you, because I think our audience is very interested in this. And I'll quote a general, since we're talking about generals, I'll quote David Petraeus. Tell me how this ends. Nils, let's start with you. How does it end? Can you see an end? Well, I can see, I can see there's a variety of possible ends. Uh, let me just make one point, which I think addresses a couple of the questions that have come up in the question and answer box. Um, you know, if you look at uh, the public opinion polls in the United States 
uh, and ask them about how the government has responded. They're pretty negative on the federal government response. Um, there's some partisan differences on that, but there's a pretty broad negative view of how the federal government has performed uh, during this pandemic. On the other hand, in most states, uh, the popularity of the governors in those states, who after all have sort of first line responsibility for managed public health in their states, um, has generally been very positive. There's a couple of exceptions. There's been quite a bit of negativity, I think, in Florida um, towards uh, Governor DeSantis there. But across the country, for the most part, people have approved of the way in which their governors have performed. Uh, you know, and it's, again, not a partisan issue. People are very positive on um, uh, Governor Newsom here in California. Uh, Cuomo in New York has become a bit of a national star. But it's also Mike DeWine in Ohio, I think, has been given very high marks for his performance um, in, in handling this. And so I think one answer is going to be uh, that different states are going to come out of this, you know, just focused on the United States, at different rates, depending on you know, the particular course of the pandemic in their state and the kinds of decisions that the political leaders at the state level are going to make. Um, you know, part of the dereliction of the effectiveness of the federal government uh, in this country, uh, part of what that means is that really the decisions are gonna come down to state level choices. Um, in terms of how it's going to go, there's so many uncertainties right now, both at uh, you know, an empirical level, as Andy was referring to, we don't know what the, you know, even now today, what the transmission rates are, what the case fatality rates are. There's all sorts of mysteries about you know, how many people have actually been infected, how many people have actually, uh, you know, how many asymptomatic carriers they are. All of those things speak to the fact that we don't know whether what appears to be a flattening of the curve now is that a result of the successful um, you know, lockdown measures that have been put in place? Is it, or is it partly a matter of seasonality of the virus? Um, different states are gonna open up at different rates. Will we see recurrences or future spikes, more waves? Um, uh, will there be seasonality to this so that we see that there's going to be perhaps um, you know, a second big wave uh, of infections next winter? Uh, will it become an endemic disease where we start, you know, we talk about cold and flu season, maybe we're going to start talking about cold flu and COVID season as just a regular part of what we have to live with. I think inevitably, whatever those outcomes are, over time, we're going to, you know, figure out, you know, how to live with this virus. But I don't think it's likely that we're going to live with in the same way after this is over or after it becomes normalized. I think that there's going to be some long-term changes to the way we interact with each other, the way we gather in groups, um, the way we segregate different parts of the population from one another, particularly the old and the vulnerable. I think these things are likely to be permanently permanent changes um, that are, are not going to be just temporary things that we're experiencing right now. Yeah, I agree with what Neil said. The one thing I would add to that is just that it may not be clearly bounded when the um, when the pandemic ends. Uh, we, we may have to figure out a new a new type of normalcy. Um, I think there's a lot of hope out there that something like herd immunity will lead to the end of the pandemic or um, the introduction of a vaccine. Um, but there are just too many uncertainties right now to, to know what the end would look like. So I think, there, as Neil said, there's a range of scenarios. With that, uh, with that lack of certainty, let's um... Let's take on some questions from Jeff. Back in the day, this is good. Back in the day, I was a cold warrior in the A&D industry. We had societal response plans for many scenarios. One was for biowarfare. This COVID-19 situation is a level two to three of those scenarios. Question, did we lose the file cabinets? Or people that know how to open them and read the plans? It feels like the federal leadership is making this stuff up as they go along. Maybe ask the Joint Chiefs of Staff to go check out the basement of the Pentagon. We've touched on this a bit, but Andy, I think it's time to take, on, take it on in a little bit more detail. Yeah, Jeff is exactly right. I mean, this is something that um, folks uh, in whether it's the Pentagon or the Health Department or, or FEMA have been planning for um, a range of similar scenarios for, for decades. Uh, and so, Indeed, um, one, one such plan that ha has gotten some discussion is a plan that was put together by the National Security Council, which had a, um, a directorate focused on global health security. 
Uh, and that directorate was put together right after the Ebola epidemic of 2014 through 2016. And it laid out a whole set of steps that need to be taken, um, not at this stage, but at the very earliest stage when there's a hint of a possible um, d dangerous outbreak on the horizon. And those are all the steps that, that were not taken. Um, make sure that your diagnostic testing system is in place. Make sure that you've got enough protective health gear, health equipment for workers. Designate a single um, expert who will be in charge of crisis communications. Uh, so we have to ask, where, where are those plans? Why weren't those um, implemented? And I think it gets back to governmental competence. And that may be the thing that people will demand after this more than anything else. I think part of the answer also, Andy, is that when that uh, plan was put together and you can actually find the 69 page public version of that plan on the internet if you look, um, it was actually briefed by the Obama National Security Council folks to a very high level group of people uh, during the transition from the Obama to the Trump administration in January, I believe it was mid-January, so just a few days before Trump took office. Um, there were 40 people at that meeting. Um, and if you look at the list, it was almost, Trump himself wasn't there, but it was all the relevant cabinet officers that you would expect, um, that you would want to have at that event. Part of the issue, however, is that since then, three quarters of those people, 31 out of the 40 people who participated in that pandemic preparedness exercise as part of the transition process are no longer with the administration. So the, the, the huge amount of turnover in the Trump administration means that the people who might have been galvanized by this were, were not in place. And actually, the people who still are there from that time period, like Steve Mnuchin, actually had been fairly effective. I mean, actually, the, the, the financial response, the response of the Fed, the response of the Treasury, has been one of the few bright spots in terms of the federal government's response to the you know, ramifying uh, implications of, of the pandemic. And I, mean, I don't know, I don't have any specific reason to know that the reason why Mnuchin has been making the moves he's been making um, and been able to collaborate fairly effectively with you know, Congress on this is because of his participation in that. But it is striking. If you look at all the other people, you know, the national security advisor, the, uh, you know, the health and human services, et cetera, all of the different layers that you would have wanted to be, uh, to be prepared and to take action. They were in place, they got briefed, but those people are not there anymore. If you don't have continuity of leadership, of course you're not gonna have effective executive action. Yeah, the continuity of leadership, uh variable here I think is really important and I've been talking to some people at the School for Advanced Military Sciences out at Fort Leavenworth about it and and it's a problem in the military and uh, one of the colonels I was talking to last week said that they're actually considering renaming their lessons learned simulations to lessons observed and he says Mark it's not clear we learn but it is clear that we observe uh, I'm going to take on another question from Nick. According to Bill Gates, there will be another global pandemic within our lifetime. What should we be doing to stop it? For example, what can we do to stop wet markets in China? And what other major threats to global health, such as poor sanitation in India? What do we do about them? I mean, I would say that if there's one thing we've learned from looking at the emergence of novel pathogens over the last couple of decades is that they, they, they tend to come next in, from unexpected places. We were anticipating um, a humanly transmissible form of bird flu uh, in 2005 um, and said we got H1N1. Um, we were worried about um, the, the release of a bioengineered pathogen. Uh, instead, we had a massive Ebola catastrophe in West Africa. Um, we, weren't, we weren't focused on um, up with the possibility of a coronavirus, or at least most, most of us were not. Um, and so I think what we really need to do is have a broad panoply of preparedness measures that are ready for a range of possible events rather than trying to predict specifically what will, um, what will occur next. I mean, having said that, obviously there are certain uh, reforms that need to be made around um, uh, detecting uh, the onset of pathogens ar uh, around rapid response, around improving global coordination and so on. And those can be made, but I think uh, we don't want to try to anticipate exactly what's going to happen next because we're continually proven wrong. I think, you know, the, the specific examples about, you know, um, you know, hygiene issues in, uh, you know, in, in rural and, 
also urban India, um, or you know, wet markets, or in China, or bushmeat in Africa. These are all things that are pretty hard to take on. I think another, you know, countries have sovereignty, and while you can offer them resources, building up the local public health capabilities of countries like that is actually a really good idea uh, as a national interest matter. So investing in the public health infrastructures of poor countries is something the U.S. should be doing in a completely self-interested way, because the best way to prevent a global pandemic is to have capacity for nipping incipient global public health catastrophes in the bud where they break out. In addition to that, though, I would say that a really important thing we should think about is having spare capacity on hand. Um, one of the challenges that's happened in the United States, uh, you know, Andy, you were talking about how there was a lot of spare capacity for ICU beds in Germany. Germany, I think, has the highest number of ICU beds per capita of any country in Europe. Um, that, what that meant was that for a long, for, you know, most of the time, 99% of the time, there's these pretty expensive pieces of equipment sitting around going unused. Um, that's a choice about how you run a public health system. If you try to optimize for maximal efficiency, which is what you do if you're a profit-oriented kind of healthcare system, then you will be trying to get rid of spare capacity, which is expensive and that you don't have to use. The lack of spare capacity um, really compromises you. And the same thing goes for other things like supply chains. You know, there's been a huge push over the last really 40 years, but especially the last 20 years, to shorten supply chains by companies that produce everything from cars to medical equipment. Um, they do that because it squeezes out the cost of inventory, lowers the amount of capital that companies have to keep on hand, but it also means that when there's a crisis, your just-in-time production system, if there's one glitch anywhere in the system, the whole system will come apart. So pushing towards maximal efficiency reduces the resiliency of systems. So I think another thing that we can do in general is to revalue the efficiency resiliency balance in terms of how we set up our complicated systems and focus more on resiliency orientation in terms of you know, our healthcare infrastructures, our supply chains, and many of the other kinds of complex vital systems that we rely on. Let's take this question from Christopher. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take the liberty of being the chair and, and provide the first answer and then turn it over to you two. From Christopher, who says, a national pandemic with a high transmission rate has been understood as having a certain probability for some time. Yet it now seems that the idea of balancing an economy with a quarantine population is just being considered for the first time. Wasn't this gamed out by somebody previous to our being in it? And the answer, Christopher, is yes, it was gamed out. But as uh, we've learned, observing lessons and actually applying the lessons are two different things. The game, uh, this is in, as a part of my uh, research into my article on Dark Winter, I came across a simulation called Event 201. Now, event, event 201 is very interesting because it wasn't actually, it was more of a discussion than a game, but they put around a very large table in a room, economic thinkers, heads of corporations, uh, heads of government departments to kind of talk through what would happen if you had a pandemic or something like a pandemic and how the economy would react and what major corporations would be doing, what the likely outcomes would become. Event 201, you talk, if you talk to people in Washington, they don't really talk about dark winter as much as they do Event 201. That, that said, Christopher, uh, while it was gamed out by somebody, uh, by a number of people previously, as we've discussed with other simulations, uh, applying the lessons learned and actually dusting off the plans and the simulations are two different things. And I'll turn it over to Andy or Nils, whichever one wants to take it on from here. Well, I'll take a quick crack at that. I, I mean, that, that simulation is really interesting and important, but I do think it's the case that a lot of the plans stopped at um, the level of what were called non-pharmaceutical interventions. If you don't have drugs, you don't have medications, what you need to do is um, test, isolate, trace, um, something like social distancing uh, in order to flatten the, flatten the epidemiological curve so that other 
biomedical countermeasures can be developed and put into place. Um, I don't think that there was a lot of thinking through of what guidelines would then allow you to open back up if you had put in place very strong social distancing measures. And that's where we are right now, figuring out um, to what extent we're willing to do a, a kind of cost benefit analysis um, when, when lives are immediately at stake. Yeah, I also think that it's really important to emphasize, and this goes back to what we were discussing earlier about the scientific process itself being in flux and uncertain, and people are in debate. One thing that's absolutely true is that the scientists can tell you to some approximation what the reality of the situation we face is. And if you ask them scenarios about different kinds of medical or social interventions, what the likely effects in terms of bending curves are. But at the end of the day, the choice about whether we want to build, uh, you know, how much death we're willing to tolerate um, for what kind of economic payoffs, that's ultimately a a political decision that political leaders are going to need to make. Uh, there's not one correct answer, and you don't get, the scientists do not have a particularly privileged view, in my opinion, for figuring out what the right balance is. Let me give you an example. There's lots of things where we tolerate a certain amount of death uh, in exchange for the conveniences that it affords. So for example, you know, something like 3,000 people a month um, in this country die in automobile accidents. Now, we don't say nobody's allowed to drive. We just accept that that kind of carnage on the roads, and, you know, it's probably an order of magnitude more than that, sustain very severe injuries in car accidents. And we accept that because the affordances and the, you know, mobility and the freedoms and the economic benefits of having people be able to drive around are something that we are willing to tolerate in exchange for, you know, what we want, and we're willing to tolerate a certain amount of carnage in exchange for that, right? I don't think that it's clear you know, what the right dividing line is between opening up um, and closing down. That's something people should have a debate about. I think, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about um, Taiwan and uh, Germany and South Korea, but a country we should also talk about probably in this regard is Sweden. Sweden has taken a very, very different approach um, than, uh, you know, than other countries. Uh, they've made social distancing basically a voluntary thing. Um, they've had a they've had a very high rate of fatalities. Um, the parts of the population that have been affected are pretty similar in Sweden to elsewhere, primarily old folks. Um, and, you know, they've been quite clear-minded. They haven't had any nonsense, oh, we're just trying to achieve herd immunity right away. What they've suggested quite straightforwardly is that life must go on. And those who are young and healthy, you know, need to have their lives be able to continue. And if some quantum of old people die a little bit sooner than they would have otherwise, that's something that the Swedish people have decided they're willing to live with. And that's a question of values. That's not a question that scientists can decide on behalf of a society. I think people will feel very differently about that. And there's been obviously a lot of sort of demonization of different kinds of positions on this issue. But there is a very severe loss, 25 million people out of work. I mean, that's unprecedented. There's never been that many Americans out of work before. The, the unemployment rate in this country is the highest it's been since the 1930s, almost certainly, the numbers haven't caught up yet with, uh, with the reality on the ground. That's a huge problem. Um, and how we're going to be able to start all that back up again is not just going to happen like that. And I don't think that it's a very clear choice that we have about how we balance those different kinds of values. Human life is obviously uh, a, a precious thing, but it's not the only thing we have to weigh. And in fact, we make cost benefit analyses about human lives all the time in insurance companies and public policy on all sorts of things. I mean, I think it's right that we make cost benefit analyses, but we usually do it in an actuarial context when we have a lot of data about what the trade-offs will be if we take a certain kind of action. The problem in this case with even trying to imagine this as a cost benefit question is that we don't have the data on what it would mean to suddenly open things up. I mean, in Sweden, they actually took a, a different tack as Nils said, but one key part of that response was making sure that the health system was resilient, that people who did get exposed to the disease would have um, good health treatment available to them. Um, we don't know whether if we um, rapidly opened up uh, the economy, we would get New York City scenarios all over the country um, it, because we don't have the kind of capacity that Sweden had. So they were very attentive to making sure that they were protecting the resilience of the health system in, in, in taking that policy decision of having social distancing be, be quite voluntary and actually quite minimal. So it's a great answer because uh, Jill says, is it a political question of how much death we are willing to tolerate? or how much of an onslaught our healthcare system can handle at once? Well, that's the question, right, that we're balancing. That's, well, that's the point. 
Yeah, and I'm, I guess I just I'll just reiterate that I think we can't even quite pose the pose the values question ourselves because we don't exactly know what how many lives are in the balance. There's there's too many uncertainties around what a given course of action might take, and I think that's why um, we acted very when we can't act in a cost benefit way because we don't have the relevant information to make the decision. We act in a precautionary way. We take an extreme measure, and I think that's why um, health officials advised us to to shut things down to protect the health system. Um, because they were quite worried about the worst case scenario unfolding. That's right. And I, I, would, I would build two additional points on that, Andy. One is that um, you make a really good point about how the Swedes have not just been willy nilly about this. They have been very attentive to making sure that the uh, public health system doesn't get overwhelmed. Different countries have different kinds of public health capacities. Uh, you know, there's, you know, the Germans, I think, have 22 uh, ICU beds uh, per 100,000 population. Um, other countries in Europe, um, have as few as five. Um, and so what the choices you have uh, are going to look different in different countries depending on how much resiliency you have in the public health system. You may need to make different trade-offs. Um, the second point though is that, um, you know, I think that a large part of the way in which we've reacted to, we in the West in particular, have reacted to and thought about how to respond to the emergence of this novel coronavirus has been established against a baseline of seeing what happened in the first country that was afflicted by this, which was China. Um, and the Chinese obviously put into place extremely, you know, after, after, you know, dropping the ball for now looks like at least six weeks and then attempting to like sort of obfuscate the truth of what was going on, you know, when she himself, uh, Xi Jinping, the, the, the premier, got personally involved, all of a sudden there was an extremely forceful response. Um, and that seemed, again, if we believe the statistics, and I think at first we really, there was a lot of, there wasn't a lot of question of the Chinese numbers at first. It looked like that was really effective. This very scary thing had happened and then the Chinese had done something very draconian to deal with it and it had gotten the thing under control. And that narrative about how things had gone in China, I think established a baseline conception of what the proper kind of response to this ought to be. Um, and so I think that many people, the reason why people have chosen a precautionary response, Andy, in part, is because that was what the Chinese did first, because they went first. So the different timelines that different countries are on mean that some countries get to or have to make these decisions first. And then people learn, less, learn lessons or lessons they think they learn because they extrapolate from what the, you know, the forerunners in this process experience, and they apply that to their own contexts. You know, one of the things that's interesting about Sweden is the plague came very late to them. And that may be one of the reasons why they've chosen a different path, because they've had more time. By the time the first cases were really arising in, in Sweden, people had begun to question the narrative about what had actually gone down in China. And that may have helped them take a little bit of a different approach, because they weren't as sort of, as it were, uh, cognitively beholden to the first responses in the first countries to be so afflicted. Do we know how Sweden is doing? I keep hearing uh, mixed reports. Are they doing well, not well? Has the strategy they've, they've adopted worked or not? Well, as of this morning, um, they've had about uh, 200 deaths per million, um, which is about what we have in the United States actually so far. Uh, it's about half of what uh, the countries that have had been hardest hit, Italy and Spain, have had. On the other hand, they're, much, uh, they're, they're three or four weeks behind these other countries. Um, and so the fact that, you know, they are, uh, now their, their curve is bending. It seems to be bending almost as fast as countries that have put into place more heavily enforced social distancing rules. Although I think it's really hard to tell because there's a reporting challenge. Um, Just to add, the other thing, interesting thing to look at with Sweden is the question of um, exposure in the population and, and something emerging close to herd immunity in the big cities like Stockholm. So there's an estimate came out that something like 25% of the population of Stockholm has um, antibodies uh, to the virus at this point, um, which you know, if that's true and if exposure confers immunity, um, Sweden would be well ahead of much of the world in, in um, being, being uh, uh, immune to the virus in, in, in a year or two. I would, uh, I would just, um, um, suggest for the record that since we all live in a global environment uh, and we all use air travel, almost all of us, that in a highly transmissible virus, uh, here we are, 
in the United States of America is kind of a petri. Some states close down and other states aren't. So Patrick asked the following question. Why hasn't a broad travel ban been instated? What is stopping someone from traveling? And if they are carriers of the virus, continuing to fuel its spread across the world? And let me give you an initial unsatisfactory answer. We live in a federal system and the states decide these things. Uh, I've always thought that initially it would have been wise to declare a state of emergency and simply to provide a mandatory guidance that would shut states down. But here we are, Georgia is open, New York is closed. We now have regional coalitions emerging of states. This is a very delicate political time in the country uh, and not everyone is on the same page. Nils? Um, well, you know, look, there's obviously there's been a huge drop in, in air travel specifically. Uh, I, I haven't looked at the numbers in a while, but there's got to have been 95% drop in air traffic. Um, particularly international travel has, you know, declined dramatically. Um, some countries have put into place travel bans. It's not totally possible to have it go to zero, partly because, you know, nationals need to be able to come back to their own country if they need to. Um, I think it could be slowed a lot more, but, you know, international travel is part of the lifeblood of the global economy. Um, shutting that down also harms our ability to reopen our economy. Um, now, maybe, I, th I believe one effect, long-term effect of the uh, of the social experience of, of the pandemic is going to be that there will be less travel. Uh, people are figuring out, as we're demonstrating right now on this call, how to do things that used to be done in person um, through virtual means. Um, you know, I think that the long-term prospects for the airline industry because of that and for the hospitality industry are probably pretty dire. Um, but there's all sorts of businesses that, you know, we're not going to be able to re, you know, even if the government says you're allowed to go back to work right away, how many people are going to really feel confident about crowding into a basketball stadium, mm -hmm. uh, you know, next, next week, even if, even if they were, even if we allowed, you know, even if the NBA opens back up um, and you can go down the list of, you know, how many people are going to want to go play with chips in Las Vegas? How many people are going to want to go to a Broadway show? How many people are going to want to do this, that, or the next thing that involves crowds? Um, it's not just air traffic. Uh, at this point, the virus is already everywhere in the world. I don't think shutting down air traffic, by itself is going to solve the problem because it's already endemic almost everywhere anyways. My final question for both of you, since I've already asked, uh, how do we get out of this? Let me ask a, a much more sp specific question. Given your scientific knowledge and your observation of society, what's gonna solve it? Are we gonna get the vaccine or are we just gonna have to buck it up and lock it down and hope for herd immunity. What's your, what's your guess? What's your prediction? What's your knowledge? I mean, I, I, I will again um, unhelpfully beg off the question based on the, on the grounds of uncertainty. I think um, vaccine development has advanced massively in the last uh, decade. Uh, so the science is incredibly impressive. There's, a, there's an unprecedented international collaboration underway to, to find vaccine candidates and test them. On the other hand, the folks that you know, know this business are, are telling us it's at least 12 months, probably 18 months or more away. Um, we haven't tried at a, on a global scale to produce any kind of vaccine um, and administer it on a short time scale um, ever, uh, much less for, for a novel type of virus like a coronavirus. So I think we're going to, at least for the time being, um, we can't wait for the, the cavalry of the vaccine to come. We're going to have to figure out other measures to live with the virus and manage it um, using social distancing, using testing, uh, all the things that we're already beginning to try out. I, I agree entirely. We don't, we, don't, we don't know exactly how it's going to end. Um, I will note that there has never been uh, a vaccine developed for any coronavirus. Uh, so even though Andy is absolutely correct that the, the science uh, has uh, increased, you know, has improved dramatically in the last uh, decade. Um, this is, you know, terra incognita to a large extent. Um, there has been some effort to produce uh, coronavirus uh, vaccines for animals, uh, for livestock uh, that have been not successful. Um, of course, there's now 
you know, again, to repeat what Andy said, an unprecedented global effort. It's one thing to keep chickens from getting sick. It's another thing to try to, you know, make sure that the whole human population, all almost 8 billion of us can be protected from this kind of thing. But, you know, at best it's 12 months away and we don't know if it's gonna mutate rapidly. Um, you know, we do have vaccines, for example, for seasonal flu, but as we all hear every year, it's, it's kind of a guess. You know, the scientists are sort of looking and some years the flu vaccine is much more effective than others. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a larger issue um, and maybe this would be my closing thought. For a very long time, particularly during the Cold War years, there was kind of a belief that humans would eventually conquer all infectious diseases. You know, uh, the polio vaccine was very successful, obviously smallpox, which to date is still the only disease which has been completely eradicated, um, you know, was successfully eradicated in the 19s, officially declared eradicated in the late 1970s. And there was this kind of belief that infectious diseases were something that we were going to conquer and that they were a thing of the, there was a thing of the traditional past. And now that we'd entered this beautiful epidemiological modernity, they would be consigned to, you know, the same kinds of things that, you know, we associated with the Middle Ages. And that's turned out not to be true. People gave up on that. And it's partly because of emerging infection, infections that began to arise in the 1980s. HIV AIDS was obviously the big story, but there were others. Um, Andy referenced Ebola, Marburg virus. Um, you know, there's all these zoonotic diseases. Those are diseases that are transmitted from animal reservoirs in the wild into humans. And as we disrupt more of, you know, the natural reservoirs um, where these uh, diseases sit, there's more and more infectious diseases that are coming out. Um, it's not clear that we're going to forever have antibiotics that work. So I think we have to look at the fact that it may be that the moment of most uh, epidemiological confidence was a passing moment. And as Andy says, what we're going to need to learn is to learn what humans have always had to live with, which is that infectious diseases are simply part of the landscape that we have to deal with uh, as being, you know, part of the biosphere of the earth. Nils, Nils, you get the last word. I think it's a good one. I think that we are going to have to learn to live with this. And um, under quarantine here in Arlington, Virginia, I want to thank you both, Andy and Nils, for your um, expertise and your insights. I want to thank the audience for all their questions, for tuning in with us. If you've missed this or want to replay it, you can do it. Uh, Wednesday's Dornsife Dialogue, be, uh, today's Dornsife Dialogue will be up and on the website. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you to our panelists. Good discussion. Thank, thank you, Mark. Mark.